Okay, so um, good afternoon, everybody, or uh, good morning, depending on where you happen to be at. Uh, and welcome to today's webinar on uh, applying stepper motors. My name is Miles Budimir, and I'm the motion control editor here at Design World Magazine. Uh, I'd like to start by uh, thanking everyone for joining us here today. And um, let me uh, let me go ahead and uh, introduce our um, presenter speaker for today. Uh, our speaker uh, presenter is Tim Burke, who is a uh, chief engineer at uh, Electrocraft. A um, little bit about Tim. Tim is currently the the chief engineer for new motor development at uh, Electrocraft, and has been designing electric motors for 30 years. Uh, which include stepper motors, brushless DC motors, AC motors, uh, and linear actuators. Uh, he holds a bachelor's, bachelor's and master's degrees in mechanical engineering from the University of New Hampshire. So um, we uh, welcome him today. And um, with that, I think I will uh, pass the baton over to Tim, if you're all ready. Very good. Thank you, Miles. Uh, good day, everybody. I guess we are ready to begin. Yep. So what we'll do this afternoon is I want to talk a little bit about how to interpret and scale uh, published uh, stepper motor data to the operating conditions of an application. Then we'll move on and discuss some of the commonly encountered application problems, uh, thermal limits and resonances. And we'll conclude with a brief discussion of stepper-based linear actuators. And I don't have control. Hang on a second here. Now I do. There we go. OK. All right, when given a new application, the first obvious thing that you have to do is define the variables that uh, describe the application. And it starts with knowing what the load is that will be reflected back to the motor, what the maximum system speed at the motor will also be, what you have available for a system voltage, what you have available to supply current to the motor, what the ambient uh, temperature environment might be. You have you know, operating in a, in a high temperature condition. Uh, and what your position requirements are, how accurately you need to position in what increment, and also how long will it take you to make uh, the, your desired move. So after those are defined, bear with me. Seems a little slow. Hmm. OK. After you define your application variables, you know, the first thing you're going to do is pick up a catalog and begin to thumb through the catalog and try and find the motor that's most appropriate for you, your, your particular needs. The first thing to look at <coughs> excuse me, will be holding torque. I'm sorry. This is very slow here. Yeah, we'll, uh, we're working on turn making that a little quicker there. Okay. There's a little bit of a delay. Anyway. All right. There we go. Finally got it blocked. Now, holding torque is really a, a great place to start for sizing the motor. You, know, you, you first define what you think you need for, for uh, loads and speeds and you know, you can quickly scan the holding torque row in a, in a manufacturer's catalog data sheet, and you know, select a motor that's obviously got got more than you need, but it, it kind of gives you a quick way to zero in on a particular frame size that you uh, that might be appropriate for your application. The next two things that are commonly expressed are resistance and inductance. Uh, those will come into play in a, in a couple of minutes uh, as I go through the, some of the later slides. And the other two to pay attention to are current and voltage. Is that working better for you, uh, Tim? Uh, it's still pretty slow. Okay. Um, why don't you give us a cue when uh, when you're going to go to the next slide, maybe, or the next point, okay, and then we'll, uh, yeah, then we'll push it on. Very good. Well, let's try that. Okay. 
So as I mentioned, oh, now I need to back up. Okay. Current, as expressed in this table, is that it's a thermally derived value for a stepping motor. So it's it's really it's the current that the motor uh, you can apply to the motor such that the winding or the internal temperatures of the motor will not exceed the rated maximums of the insulation system. And the last parameter I wanted to quickly touch on is voltage. Now this is not the maximum voltage that can be applied to the motor. It is simply the motor's rated current times the particular phase resistance for that winding. And it will become important as we move forward. OK, next slide. OK, so after you've looked at the catalog pages and selected you know, your approximate uh, motor frame size, you're going to look on the other, other side of the sheet, typically, and you're going to find a uh, torque speed curve for the stepper. Now, a, a, a typical rule of thumb for speed limits for steppers for the smaller frame size, this is 17s uh, typically, you're going to find that useful torques are developed up to about 3,000 RPM or 10,000 full steps a second. And for larger frame sizes, such as size 34s, that practical limit is probably about 1,500 RPM or 5,000 full steps a second. Now, the torque speed curves are, are really a measure of the maximum applied torque on the motor that it will tolerate before it loses synchronism at a particular speed. All right. And what, I've, what I have shown here are four curves for the same motor, with the only variation being a change in the system supply voltage. Now, I, I have expressed that system supply voltage using this term called over-voltage ratio. And over-voltage ratio is simply that supply voltage divided by the motor voltage that I showed on the catalog uh, table. And, and typically for, for good performance, you want that over voltage ratio to be about 15 or higher. So you can see actually I, the plots range from, from over voltage ratios of 15 up to 40. And obviously uh, uh, there is a fairly significant benefit in, in high speed performance uh, as I increase that supply voltage. Now, one last comment. Since steppers are typically used in an open loop mode, the uh, application torque that you are designing around, you typically don't want to use the maximum torque as expressed on these curves. You typically want some, some safety margin between your application load and the maximum uh, torque available at, at that particular speed. And usually that, that ratio is a you know, factor of safety of about 1.2 to 1.4 or 70 to 80 percent. Uh, of the maximum torque at your at your speed is a safe uh, operating condition. Okay, next slide, please. Now I'm going to take a quick detour here and talk about the motor current rise and and the most common available uh, drives uh, that are in use today, and those are so-called constant current or current regulating drives. So can you advance the slide? All right, this first line that shows up here is the current rise that is seen if I apply motor rated voltage onto the winding. You can see it's an exponential rise and reaches steady state you know, rated current, which is simply motor voltage divided by resistance. Uh, next, OK, the second line, the red line that's shown here, is that same current rise if I were to apply a system voltage, which is 15 times my motor voltage or over voltage ratio of 15. OK, next one. Now, this, this green line that you see here, which outlines the shaded region, is typically what you'll find in a constant current or a current regulating drive. In other words, the, the current profile will follow that high voltage curve until it reaches the rated current value for uh, for the motor. And then the drive will pulse width modulate the applied voltage to maintain that rated current until the uh, phase state for the motor changes and the current is pumped into the other phase. So what you'll see is if you look at the three dash line, three vertical dash lines, starting at the far right hand one at a low step rate. Uh, you'll see that both the current regulating drive and if I simply just put motor voltage onto the winding, I would still reach rated current. However, 
because the current rise time using a, a higher supply voltage is much quicker, you know, my, the average torque over that on time will be higher and the motor will generate more torque. That becomes even more apparent as I move to the left. At medium step rates, again, you'll see that so this time, actually, the, the bottom curve no longer reaches rated current while the uh, current regulating or constant current drive will. So again, uh, you'll get additional torque. And then the, the furthest line to the left, closest to the vertical axis, it corresponds to a high step rate. And at these kinds of step rates, even with the high system supply voltage, I, I still do not reach my rated current value during the on time for the winding. However, given that I have the, the high voltage, I still have a higher average current during my on time and I will still generate more torque than if I only applied the low voltage. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and here is actually are just some pictures of what, of what motor phase currents look like at varying speeds. This is the same motor operating at four different speeds. Um, and actually, this motor is operating in, in half-step mode. So if you look at the table on the left, you'll see the, the uh, phase energization sequence for a half-step condition, which consists of, if I look at the phase A column, initially the phase is off for the first step. It's on for three with a positive current. It's off for one, and then on for another three with current flowing in the opposite direction. So in the first picture, in the upper left-hand corner, you can see I've really got a modified square wave. And at, at these low step rates, the current rise time is inconsequential. If I move to the right, top row right now, I'm stepping at a, at a higher speed, and you, you can begin to see that the current rise time does become significant. Uh, and then moving to the bottom row, bottom left now, this is a picture of the current in the motor winding just at the point where I'm reaching rated current before I change the on state for that winding. And then the last picture, of course, is, is operating at a high speed where the current no longer reaches my rated current value during its on time. And really, at this point, that current shape is, is strictly a function of the applied voltage. In other words, if I had a higher system supply voltage, that current, uh, average current would be a little bit higher than it, than it is here. OK, next slide, please. Now we'll just, let's jump back to stepper torque speed curves. So really, I can, I can divide my stepper torque speed curve into two regions. The first region uh, is a region of shallow slope. Uh, and it really is the region in which my current drive is still able to reach rated current. And then as the speeds increase, I no longer can reach current, uh, my rated current condition, and I'm operating really more as a voltage drive, and that's shown as a line with steeper slope out at the higher speeds. Now, if you are, if you look at the manufacturer's published data, and your operating conditions differ from the conditions that are used to generate the curve, you can use that information to actually scale this curve up or down so that you can estimate what your system performance will be. And the, the, the transition point and the maximum speed point both scale by this by the ratio of either system supply voltages if you're using the same motor uh, or scale by over voltage ratio. Um, and we'll give you an example of that in just a second. One other quick comment. If you if you look at low speed torque of a stepper and compare it with holding torque, you'll notice that the, the maximum low speed torque is only about 70 to 80 percent of the published holding torque. And that's simply because the, the the torque versus position profile of a stepper follows a sine curve. And so the holding torque value is the peak of that sign, whereas the low speed running torque is the average torque over uh, one step. OK, next slide, please. OK, this we're going to just run through a quick example of uh, scaling these speed torque curves or torque speed curves. All right, first curve, advance me one here. All right, this, so this is, this is measured data using a system supply voltage of 24 volts. All right, next curve. So then what we'll do is we'll approximate it using my, my two straight line uh, approximation. 
So now I've got a yep a, a, an approximation of the 24 volt curve. Now I want to operate it at 48 or double my over voltage ratio. So both that transition point and the maximum speed point are going to scale by a factor of two. So you can see the purple line shows my predicted values. And then one more curve, please. And here's what the actual measured data was. So it's a you know it's it's a it's a reasonable quick approximation of the performance you're going to get, so that you can confirm whether or not your uh, selected motor operating under your conditions is going to come close to meeting your application needs. All right, next slide, please. All right, one other way to influence the the uh, torque speed behavior of the motor is through various connection schemes. If you look at the diagrams on the right. What I show here is uh, a, a motor with eight uh, motor leads being brought out from the winding. So both phase A and phase B are split in half, and then each of those halves have, have leads brought out. So it's possible to do a series parallel and then a so-called half copper, which I'll talk about. Um, so looking at the top diagram, that's a simple series connection. Is the two windings of phase A are connected in series. And what you'll see if you then look at the uh, torque speed curve, this connection allows you the highest low speed torques, but torque falls off rapidly with speed and at some point will fall below uh, the torque developed by the other, some of the other connection schemes. So moving to the parallel, uh, it's obvious you just take the two phase halves and connect them in parallel. Uh, now you'll find that the low speed torque is approximately one half of the uh, low speed torque of the series connection. However, if you do need to operate at high speeds, you can, uh, you know, using this configuration, you will get more more torque developed. So, you know, typically we've seen people do this um, during prototype development when they're not exactly sure of their application loads. You can get a, a eight lead motor and try different connection schemes out and see which best fits your your application requirement. Um, and now the last, oh, one, other, one other comment actually before I leave the parallel, if you look at the, the, the table on the left hand side and you look at um, the, the power loss row. So for the series connection you'll see that my, my I squared R loss or my winding loss at low speed uh, is a factor of four greater than the I squared R loss for the parallel connection. So even, you know, I've developed twice the torque, but I also have four times the power loss in the winding at that, at that operating point. Okay, now the last connection, uh, so-called half copper, that would be if I only used half the available winding and put current through it. Now, typically you wouldn't use this, except um, you can often get a six-leaded configuration from stepping motor manufacturers. Now, six-leaded windings are typically, or used, in the past for operations with a different drive type, with a unipolar drive, which isn't very common anymore, but, but many manufacturers still list the six-leaded configuration. The six-leaded is, uh, if you look at the, at the blue or the, or the series connection, the way a six-leaded uh, connection works is that the connection which puts the two phase halves in series is made internal to the motor and a winding is, I mean, uh, excuse me, a lead is brought out from, from that uh, center connection. So with that, as I said, you're able to put current through only half the winding, and you'll get speed torque behavior which is very similar to the parallel connection. Um, the only difference, again, if I look at the, the power loss row in my table, you'll find that uh, the power loss in this configuration is twice what it would be for the parallel, but still only half what I had in the series connection. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, let's talk about some thermal considerations of, of applying a motor. Typically, steppers are very conservatively rated. The, this, as I mentioned at the beginning, the rated current that's listed in the, in the data tables is a thermally derived number. Uh, and it's done by uh, typically hanging the motor in still air, applying full current to both phases and holding the motor either in stall or operating at very low speeds. And then the, the current is selected such that the 
the winding temperature does not exceed the insulation rating uh, uh, for the winding system. And most of Electrocraft motors, that, that internal winding limit is 130 degrees C. OK, next slide, please. OK, now if, uh, with, with a couple of parameters, it's possible to predict the temperature rise of the device. And most manufacturers will make available uh, data which would allow the, the simple model that I showed at the top of the slide first. Um, the the two-node or simple model consists of a winding temperature and an ambient temperature connected with a thermal resistance between the two of them and then a, a thermal time constant for the winding itself. So as I said, most while some of these manufacturers publish it, uh, most manufacturers will have these available upon request. And if I look at the plot, the data or temperature rise, measure, experimental temperature rise for a motor is shown in blue, and then the two-node model is the red curve. So you can see that it, it, it follows the behavior. It is not an exact predictor of the motor temperature. However, um, if anything, it's a little bit conservative in, in that it shows uh, reaching temperatures quicker than the actual data uh, reflects. If you need an exact prediction or a very, very close prediction of uh, winding or motor temperature rise, then you need to go to a slightly more complex model where we add an additional temperature to the model and it becomes a, a three-node model. Where in this, in this model, I've got winding temperature, motor external or motor case temperature, and ambient temperature. And then I would, happen to, I would need two thermal constants, one for the winding and one for the motor case. And if you look at the, the three-node line shown on the plot, um, it is, does a, a very good job of predicting actual motor temperatures versus time. So with these thermal models, you know, if we had uh, motors operating with different duty cycles or under high ambience or things like this, we could predict uh, whether our motor was going to operate successfully and not exceed it the thermal limits of the device. Okay, next slide. So if I don't have continuous duty or I'm operating under uh, conditions that such that the motor won't reach its maximum temperature, you know, uh, I mentioned before that, that these ratings were derived by the motor hanging in still air. There's no heat sinking applied to, to the motor when it's rated. So in many applications, you know, the motor is bolted to some sort of a structure that, that will help to, to draw heat away from the motor. Um, so you might want to take advantage of that and increase the current to the motor and get more torque. Uh, however, as you can see on this particular plot, this is a plot of torque or holding torque versus applied current. Uh, and you can see that it is not a linear relationship. Is that as the current is increased, the torque begins to fall off. That's really due to magnetic uh, saturation within the design of the motor. Um, and so what I've shown here are two vertical lines, one at uh, one and a half amps at so-called rated current condition, and then one line, the vertical red vertical line, at twice that uh, rated condition. And what you'll, you know, you, for a for a doubling in applied current, I'm only going to get, get approximately 50% increase in available torque. So again, if I look at, at low speed I squared R losses, you know, I've, I've increased the power loss in the winding by a factor of four, yet I've only gained about 50% more in, in output torque. So I, just the word of caution, be careful if you're trying to overdrive the motor and that you're not really, you're not necessarily going to get as much as you think you can. Okay. Next slide. So far, when I've talked about losses in the motor, I've really restricted myself to I squared R or winding losses. And those losses are, are really dominant at low speed. But there is another loss mechanism that, that warrants a look, and that's uh, core loss. Uh, core loss is primarily found in the state of lamination, and it's cre created when the magnetic field reverses in the lamination itself. And there are two uh, components to that core loss, a hysteresis component and an eddy current. Both of them are functions of the step rate 
and the eddy current is actually a function of the square of the step rate. So um, it obviously becomes more important as the speed goes up. And what you see on the plot, uh, it, it begins with a, with a simple uh, torque speed curve, but I've then superimposed the various loss components on the same, uh, same plot using the, the, the right-hand axis represents the power loss. Um, so quickly running through the components, the red line corresponds to the windings I squared R loss. So as one would expect, it's highest at low speeds and then falls off rapidly as the current in the winding uh, drops. And then the green line represents the core loss. So at low speeds, it's really not a factor at all. And then as, as motor winding, uh, motor speeds increase, it becomes more and more into play. And the violet or purple line represents the sum of those two components. So for most motors, the, the joule loss or I squared R loss is the dominant form. However, in, in small motors that are capable of high speeds, it's quite possible that the loss at high speed is equal to or may even exceed the low speed losses. OK, next slide, please. All right, one of the other things you had to be aware of when you were defining your application was what you needed for system accuracy. Now, there really are, are three components to uh, stepping motor accuracy. First is uh, uh, fundamental resolution, which is really uh, 360 degrees divided by the number of steps within that one revolution. And, and it's really defined by the internal geometry of the motor. Um, there are two very commonly available resolutions, either 1.8 or 0.9 degree, and those are defined by effectively the number of teeth that you'd find on the exterior surfaces of the rotor. Or in the case of a 1.8 degree motor, that uh, you'll find 50 teeth around the circumference of the rotor. In the case of a 0.9 degree, it'll be double that or 100 teeth around the, around the circumference. Next, step-to-step -step accuracy. Now, step-to-step -step accuracy is just as it sounds. It's the percent error um, that I find when I advance uh, from one step to the next. So it's a non-cumulative error, and it's typically 3 to 5 percent of the full step size. So 3 to 5, in the case of a 1.8 degree, it's 3 to 5 percent of that 1.8 degrees. And it's influenced by the application friction. So if you uh, have a high friction environment, then your system accuracy, of course, is going to be poorer. And then the other influence on, on accuracy is the uh, uh, really internal uh, design of the motor itself and how stiff the motor is. The last piece of the angle accuracy component is hysteresis. Now, if I approach the same position from the, uh, both directions, I will find that I won't lie in exactly the same spot you'll typically see this hysteresis error as about, again, 3% of a full step. OK, next slide. Microstepping. I think probably a, a lot of folks are using microstepping, so I wanted to spend just a minute or two talking about that. Um, you know, it's possible to subdivide the, the geometrically defined step positions into smaller increments by modulating currents in each motor phase. Uh, in the case of full and half-step modes, I'm applying full current to one or both phases at each step. But in the microstepping case, you know, I'm, I'm applying a ratio of currents to each of the two phases to define an equilibrium position, which is between the full or half-step situation. And the picture that I show here actually is uh, a microstepping operation um, and it, typically, you apply a sine or cosine-shaped current wave to the motor windings. So you'll see, if you count them here, I believe there are 16 quantized steps, which, which uh, closely approximate a sine wave uh, within one half wave of that, of that picture. OK, next slide. Now, a, a, a word of caution, I guess. If you're using microstepping as in, in positioning mode, you need to be very careful. Um, and this, we'll walk through the slide quickly to, to explain why. So what I see with these two pictures 
uh, is a pick of their plots of torque versus position. So in the full step case, the blue line represents my torque for step one. So I'm going to assume I'm resting at about uh, position zero uh, in step one, and then I'm going to energize and move to the torque curve shown in red or step two. So you can see the instant I do that, I'm going to generate maximum torque. Uh, and, and then I will move, obviously, to the right until I settle into a position approximately 1.8 degrees away. Now, I've shown a green band here, which represents the system friction. So the, the positional error that I will find is really uh, defined by the intersection of my torque curve and the upper and lower bounds of the friction band. So you can see if I look at the width of that error, it's a small percentage of the 1.8 degree full step. Now if I move to the microstepping case, same conditions, I'm starting at step one and moving to step two. So the instant I do that, I now move to the red line, and first first comment is that my available torque that's generated is again is nowhere close to the, the peak value, but it's still positive torque, so I'm going to start my move. Uh, then I'm going to would settle into a position which is uh, one sixteenth away from of, of one point eight degrees away from zero, so it's at a little over a tenth of a degree. However, I've got the same friction band shown on this plot, and if I look at my position error, it's again defined by the intersection of that red line and the upper and lower friction band. So you can see it's a very significant portion of the actual step increment. So my positional error will be much higher in microstepping if I'm using microstepping as a means of uh, finely positioning, unless I do my absolute utmost and minimize the friction of the system. OK, next slide. I'm going to quickly talk about, about uh, motion profiles, but I'm not really going to spend much time since the process of, of developing acceleration ramp timing um, is really a, a long presentation in itself. But a couple of quick comments. Uh, first, if you compare a stepping motor to other commonly available uh, motor types, you'll find that the low speed torque of the stepper is king. And that's really due to the high pole count uh, of the stepper. So that results in the ability to accelerate very quickly, you know, high torque to inertia ratios. Um, the other quick comment is, look, is the there is a rate at which I can apply a fixed frequency pulse stream to the motor and have it pull into synchronism uh, without without uh, losing steps, and that's known as the start stop rate of the of the motor. Um, And if I need to run at speeds higher than this, of course, I can start the stop-stop rate and accelerate up to my, my final desired speed. Now, the start-stop rate is, is inversely proportional to the square root of the, of the total inertia. So um, just be aware that if your system inertia increases, that start-stop rate will drop. OK, next slide. All right. Common failure modes. The first one I'm going to touch on, I'm going to touch on two, um, is, is stepping the motor at its, at its natural frequency. Uh, the motor is really a simple spring mass system. So there is, there is a uh, resonant frequency, which is really defined by, that, by the, the spring rate of the motor and the total inertia. Uh, I show the equation in one of the bullet points here. A quick comment is that that constant A is 50 for a 1.8 degree and 100 for a 0.9 degree. Now the, the, the low speed or low frequency resonance or natural frequency, you'll find it somewhere in the band of 150 to, to 450 steps a second. Um, and as you see in the equation, it's also heavily influenced by, by whatever inertia you're reflecting back to the motor. Um, there really are, I guess there are, there are, are three ways, although I only show two. One is to never step at the rate of the natural frequency. The second one would be to add damping or friction to the system. You know, that's not without 
uh, other penalties such as loss of accuracy. And the third is to, is to employ microstepping. Now, microstepping will help to quiet the resonant response, uh, the response because of the, the forcing function that would be exciting the resonance is diminished. Uh, when you're microstepping, one of the primary benefits is a reduction in the torque ripple from step to step. So the, uh, I say the excitation which would force you into this resonance is, is, is uh, somewhat reduced. Okay, next slide, please. All right, the second common failure mode occurs at, at higher speeds and correspondingly is known as mid-frequency resonance. Now, it's, it's usually a, a less severe, but many times it's, it's not avoidable. Um, you can accelerate through the resonant condition, but if, if you happen to, to be needing to operate at, within the speed band um, of the resonance, you know, you'll very, very often find the system will fail. Now, the mid-frequency resonance is really traced to, a, to an oscillation of the voltage that's generated inside the the winding itself, and you, um, it, it, it's that, that voltage will appear to be both amplitude and frequency modulated, which then creates uh, a current ripple, which, which finally results in torque disturbances being applied to the system, and those, those torque disturbances can be large enough for you to uh, lose synchronism. And what I show in the, in the top picture here, you know, attempting to capture the, the oscillation in the current wave. I think you, you can sort of see the ghosting that's going on in that current trace. If there are, if there's a speed range in which to avoid or to look for this resonance, it would be, it would be, just beyond the point where you lose current regulation with the current drive. So you will commonly find it there, although it is influenced by by your system parameters, as you know. Uh, Inertial loads and, and frictions, again, will move that around. Uh, there are many drives available on the market today which offer either, it's either known as electronic damping or current damping, which then which will sense this current oscillation and quiet it down and allow you to, to operate in the region without, without problem. Okay. Next slide, please. All right, I wanted to just quickly go over uh, stepping motor linear actuators. Um, I mean, they're a simple, inexpensive means of creating linear motion within the envelope of, of the motor. Um, and they're, they're low cost, they're capable of reasonably high forces and high resolutions. All right, next slide, please. There are two types that are commonly available. One is a translating screw where the nut is attached to the rotor of the stepping motor, and the nut is, is usually a um, engineering polymer. And for here, if you have long travels, you must allow clearance for the screw both on the front and back side of the motor. And then the translating nut where the screw is attached to the rotor of the motor, and then the nut is external. And if you clamp the, the nut, it will then travel up and down the shaft as, as the rotor turns. Okay, next slide, please. There are two commonly uh, used screw types uh, in these actuators. The first is an Acme screw. Um, it's uh, low cost. Again, as I mentioned before, typically a, a plat engineering polymer would be used for the nut, uh, both with and without lubrication. Uh, efficiency ranges for these screws go anywhere from about 0.3 to about 0.7, and you'll find that the backlash ranges from two to seven thousandths for these devices. The other type of screw that's, that's used is a ball screw, which is, offers much, much higher efficiency, primarily because of its, uh, its rolling friction rather than sliding friction. Uh, and that low friction leads to better accuracy. Uh, the costs are higher, and, and there is also a wide range of costs for these uh, ball screws because of the different manufacturing techniques that can be used to manufacture the screw itself. Um, and, and backlashes are anywhere from zero uh, to about ten thousandths of an inch. Okay, next slide, please.
So rather than torque speed curves with these devices, I need to worry about, obviously, force versus speed. Uh, and there's an additional variable that's available to tailor the force speed curve to the application, and that's the pitch of the screw. So I show on this particular plot three different curves, each representing the same motor with a different uh, pitch of the screw or a different lead of the screw. Um, so I, looking at them quickly, the, the red line corresponds to a thread lead of a sixteenth of an inch, the B to an eighth of an inch, and the C to a uh, quarter inch lead. So correspondingly, you'll see the speed doubles as the lead doubles. Um, but notice that the thread efficiencies are uh, variable and depend on the, or a function or a, of the lead. So, so the coarser threads have higher thread efficiencies. And you, this is particularly apparent if you look at the green and red curve. If I, the, if I took the green one and then want it and, and cut my lead in half, first order of approximation would say I should get about 100 pounds. In, um, however, because of the change in efficiency, I'm really only able to develop about 90 pounds. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, accuracy uh, of the linear actuator versus the stepper. Uh, really, same sort of same three uh, components. A resolution in this case is not only the, the, the angular increment per step, and it's also the uh, thread lead influences the, the linear resolution. And if you look at the table that's at the bottom, you will find that the resolutions of these devices are actually uh, very, very good. Okay, and the coarsest thread uh, with the quarter inch lead, I'm still having a a resolution of uh, one and a quarter thousandths per step. Now, accuracy of these devices is really not as not it's not the three to five percent that I find of the rotary motor because I've also got lead error of the screw itself, and uh, for a for an Acme lead screw, that lead error is about uh, six ten thousandths of an inch per inch. And then, of course, friction again will be will be the killer here, and will will damp will be detrimental to the overall system accuracy. And then the last component to mention is repeatability. Now, I, in the earlier slide, I talked a little bit about screw backlash, um, and repeatability is hurt here because if if I reverse direction and then want to return to the same position, the first few steps after I reverse direction are taken up uh, in backlash. So I'll have uh, so-called lost motion when, it, when direction is reversed. OK. And I think that's it. The next slide, please. So in summary, uh, we spent a little bit of time talking about torque speed curves and how to use published data and adapt it for your application. Um, and then a quick discussion on thermal modeling and how to interpret stepper's ratings and how to, if you need to, to predict uh, motor temperatures. Uh, Microstepping, again, the word of caution is if you're using it for positional situations, be, be aware uh, that your accuracy will not be equivalent to the 3 to 5 percent that you would see if you were polar half-stepping the device. And then we finished up with a quick discussion on linear actuators and the influences of screw pitches on uh, the, app, the motor behavior uh, and four speed curves of linear actuators. So at this point, I guess I will open it up to questions. OK. Uh, thanks, Tim. Um, I want to uh, uh, let everyone know here that uh, now is our typical uh, Q&A period. So if you have any questions for, for Tim uh, at all on any aspect of the webinar on stepper motors, um, go ahead and feel free to um, to use the uh, control panel there and enter your question, and we will uh, uh, we will get right to your questions. Then, I uh, also want to um, remind everyone that uh, uh, everybody on the uh, webinar today, everybody who registered, basically, uh, will receive a copy of the of the webinar. Um, so, um, with that, uh, we'll see if there's any any questions uh, coming in yet. Um, 
Actually, I did have I did have one kind of question for you, Tim. Uh, back when you were talking about thermal ratings, um, I know that uh, it, it's a it's a common problem uh, when, when people use stepper motors in, in in applications. That one of the one of the issues is is thermal issues. Um, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how people can kind of um, minimize those problems or things they could do to um, you know to, um, to to steer clear of some of those thermal issues that, that pop up. Yeah, it's, you know, it's really a system design question. Um, it, it, there, you know, there, there, obviously, obviously, other other methods of cooling come you know, come into play. You know, so force cooling helps tremendously. Any type of heat sinking that can be applied to suck heat away from the motor. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, there, there's really no magic bullet, I think, to solving a thermal a thermal problem, and it's really application dependent. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned, but but in addition to monitoring or to using the thermal model, if you just monitor the case temperature, I mean, there's typically a, a 25 degree difference between the the motor winding temperature and the and the surface temperature of the motor. So after you install the motor into your application, you know, if you just wanted to monitor that that surface or case temperature, and as long as it's below about 110 degrees C, you should be fine. Okay. All right. Actually, uh, we have uh, we have some questions rolling in here. Here's one that uh, that does deal with the with the uh, temperature issue. It's a question from Brian Burke, uh, who asks, um, "Can motors be designed with internal temperature sensors to monitor the winding temperatures?" They they certainly can. It's e much easier done in the larger frame sizes, size mm -hmm. 34s and larger. Okay. Um, in in the the little motors, um, just the size of the sensor itself can become an issue, but um, we certainly have we certainly have embedded thermocouples in windings before and brought that out. Okay. So yes. Okay. Um, we've got another question here. Uh, this one's from Alan Carr. Uh, so uh, his question is: So is a higher supply voltage always better? And how do you select a supply voltage to avoid resonant frequencies at uh, desirable RPMs? Okay, the, the first part of that question, like it's, uh, I guess the simple answer is yes. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're trying to get more dynamic performance out of the device, the higher the voltage, the better off you're going to be. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the second half of the question, um, the, the problem with, with that mid-frequency resonance situation is that is also influenced by supply voltage. And, and so if you, do, if you do encounter that particular problem, Mm -hmm. Small changes in system voltage will will move that around, and it may be enough to move you away from uh, operating in, in the mid frequency band. Mm -hmm. So um, it, there isn't really a great way of uh, predicting that without a lot of analytical work. And, and so if you do find yourself running into that resonant condition, um, playing with that system supply voltage is a great way to try and move it around. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, we have another question here. Uh, this is from uh, Ash, and uh, wants to know: uh, Are there uh, is there any software out there for thermal modeling, or maybe perhaps what's a what's a good software package maybe for that too? Yeah, um, there's there is, and there's a couple that actually are specific to motors. Mm -hmm. One is is uh, I think published put out by uh, Influitica. Okay. Yeah, I think I've heard of that one. Yeah. And the other is the, the the speed group has a thermal modeling software as well, which is appropriate for motors. Yes. Any of those uh, have some? Or I mean, I don't know how how well you know those, but any any pros or cons to either one or pluses? Or I, I haven't used. All? I've only used the speed, the speed one a couple times, um, mm -hmm. and it, it has worked actually reasonably well. I don't have any direct experience with the with the Influtica package. Okay. Okay. Uh, fair enough. Let's see if, uh, if we have any more questions out there. Uh, I don't see I don't see any other questions at the moment. But uh, I think we've still got a few minutes left here, maybe. So um, you know, if, uh, if someone does have a have a question, feel free to to go ahead and uh, and post that up there, and we'll we'll try to certainly try to try to get to it. Um, Okay, here's one. Uh, here's another one from Alan, actually, who asked the earlier question about supply voltage. Um, 
He wants to know, uh, can you comment on the significance of inductance? Sure, sure. Um, both inductance and generated voltage are what are, um, are going to slow the current response or the current rise uh, in the winding. So as the speed goes up, of course, uh, that uh, the inductance becomes more and more into play in, in, <coughs> excuse me, in, the, in, in the ability to, to push current into the winding. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you look at, you know, I talked a little bit about the transition point between the current regulating part of the speed, uh, torque speed curve and the voltage derived portion. Uh, with a lower inductance motor, uh, you will find that, that that transition point moves out to a higher speed. Okay. Okay. Um, here's another question from uh, Eric Verbist. Uh, it says, what kind, of what kind of coupling is best between load and motor? Uh, somewhat flexible or very soft? Well, um, I, I don't know if there's, a, if there's a single answer to that one either. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like a, it sounds like it might be more uh, uh, application driven, I guess, too, right? It, it really is. I mean, if you're operating at low speed, such that that, that low speed resonance point is a problem. Mm -hmm. um, if you, you know, and and, and I, I said one of the parameters in the calculation of that is the stiffness of the motor. Well, if you had a very stiff coupler, that might also influence uh, where that particular low speed residence point is found. So in that case, I might want you to move to a stiffer, stiffer coupling. Um, so, but yeah, I think it's, I think it is an application really specific uh, uh, answer. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Uh, let's see if we have, uh, if we have anything else here. Uh, we might have a few more minutes left. <clears throat> maybe, a, maybe another minute or two or so, or uh, if someone if someone else does have a question, uh, I guess I'd feel free to post. We've been, I think we've, uh, I think we've gotten most of them, if not all of them, really, that have kind of been coming in here. So, um, otherwise, I guess I can just uh, uh, remind everyone again that um, <clears throat> uh, that the webinar will be uh, available at designworldonline.com and uh, through email. There, as you can see on your on your screen, probably. Um, and several ways that you could connect. Actually, the previous slide there had uh, Tim's contact uh, uh, information, had my contact information on there uh, as well. Thank you. Um, so if you need to contact uh, either of us, you can. You got the the uh, information there, which will also be in the in the um, in the uh, presentation that that everyone will will receive as well. So um, I think maybe with that, then we could. Uh, see, do we have any other? Questions or uh, let's see, maybe maybe one more. Can we get one more in here? Um, okay, here's one. Maybe this will be the last one. Um, the question is, what are the best practices for avoiding position loss in an open loop in an open loop system? That's from Alan as well. Yeah, you know, I, I think unfortunately I mentioned it many times in the presentation, and it's still my same answer. And that's whatever you can do to minimize uh, overall friction in your system is is going to be the best thing that you can do. Uh -huh. um, and, and in that case, you know, the, 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 jumping back to the coupling question, you know, if you'd want to, you wouldn't want your your stiffness of the coupling to influence the accuracy of your system either. So in that case, a stiffer coupling would be better. Mm -hmm. um, um, I really think those are those are the primary things to look at. Uh, so basically, friction. Basically, that that basically would be the biggest one. Yep. Yeah, you got it. Okay. All right. Well, um, that sounds good. Then I think we'll uh, I think we'll probably then uh, wrap it up with that. Then right. So uh, once again, I'd like to uh, like to thank our uh, presenter today, Tim Burke. Thanks uh, thanks so much. Uh, for sharing your your knowledge today with us, and thank you uh, everyone for joining us today. And uh, hope you uh, hope you found it valuable and uh, you learned something. And uh, again, you can uh, contact us through uh, through the uh, information that will be uh, available with the webinar, which is which will be available online and also via email too. So, um, and with that, I guess we'll say goodbye and I wish everybody a good uh, rest of the week. All right, thank you everybody. Okay. Thank you, Tim.